All right, let's wrap up our class. We'll do that in keeping with our discussion of succession, but really talking about some of the actions that we can do specifically to maintain our resources. And before we do that, I do want to introduce one last bit of complexity about forest development following disturbances. Um, reiterate again, the change is constant, and I want to show you one way that uh, seeing the future of a forest means being able to see its past. Um, and then lastly, we're just going to talk about some management things. And these are topics that are uh, relevant no matter what forests and what kind of products you're trying to manage whether that's just straight biodiversity, or um, in this case, this is an example from the Algarve region of um, Portugal. And what you're seeing back here, are these numbers on these trees, this is native cork oak forests, and these are being managed for cork production. But regardless of what you're doing it, many of these concepts are going to be the same. Okay, so that complexity that I'm promised. Well, remember we were talking about single age stands? Well, real stands, um, this, this kind of stand structure can be achieved, but oftentimes what we want is something that's more, more complex. It's more resilient to disturbances, and it also, if you can create this kind of uh, diameter distribution, you also have uh, the potential for rapid reestablishment of stands in, in areas that are being managed for timber. Great, right? Great, works on paper. Um, What's important to know is that this is an idealized distribution. Real systems look like this. All the data that we analyze in this class actually looks like this. And it gets even more complicated because when you have a bunch of different species that are mixed in there. Um, even age stands, doesn't matter whether it's young or old, have a low range of variability and that can be a problem. Um, real stands are likely to have a distribution of trees that are more like this, but um, the actual distribution of the trees will look pretty random, even though you might be able to fit a curve or a relationship across this, which would be this kind of reverse J structure that you're seeing here. That's what it's sometimes called. I always like to revisit something that we talk about very early on in this class, and that's space. Forest management fits within a hierarchy of policy and possible actions. Uh, foresters have, I've been called out at conferences, and I think rightly so. Foresters manage at the stand level. Policy can apply at the landscape level. But if you're talking about practice, it's going to happen at the stand level. So dealing with our problems means you have to understand what people can actually do as individuals. You can thin stands, you can get rid of fuels within stands. And it's up to policymakers to figure out how to make that, those actions of individuals address our problems at the larger scales. So um, that's about as, as much as I really can say about this. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that's important to add here is, you know, what do modern human societies need for us to provide? Well, we need water. We need fiber and timber. We need fire safe communities. And it's going to be some kind of collaboration, you know, among these kinds of levels of actors that's going to get us there. It's not going to be easy, but it is worth it. And I do actually think that it's possible. Okay, lastly, ecological memory or hysteresis, these kinds of delayed responses. That's what this is what I mean by seeing the forests. Understanding the future of the forest oftentimes meaning uh, uh, relies on knowing something about its past. Uh, forest stands remember, in a sense, or they are shaped by what happened to them in the past. Uh, tree level adaptations determine responses to disturbance, but that is itself an evolutionary legacy. Seed banks whether they are an evolutionary adaptation or just simply whether they are present or not, will influence what comes after. Um, if you don't have, if you have a lot, have a high seed bank, particularly with these species like Ceanothus, you can have extensive reestablishment after a fire in coastal California. Um, and if you want Ceanothus, that's great. But if you don't, um, it's good to know 
uh, that it's there and it might get in your way. <laughs> um, you know, and then of course I mentioned uh, last week we talked about this this example in New England, the clearance of New England and how it structures forest composition uh, at the landscape scale today. So one thing, last thing to keep in mind, management can control species composition and size and age class distributions and even fuels. But it's up to us to decide how to use that, when to use it, and what techniques to apply in order to get the things that we need from forests. All right, so here are some examples. And last thing, like this is basically what I want to motivate you to do. Do something, do something, do something. We've got so many problems, so many problematic stands, so many problematic forests, and that needs passion, it needs you to go out and do the hard work of getting this stuff done. I'm doing the best I can, okay? I am. Here I am standing in the middle of a treated area, looking up and hoping that these trees don't fall on me. Um, this is a hand crew thinning uh, treatment. These are piles here, um, you know, of uh, just cleared fuels. Uh, this was a very dense stand prior to these treatments. And um, essentially what we found and what we're finding in the study is what I'm working on right now is that um, doing something can make a big difference. Now you have different options about what you can do on landscape. So for example, you can pile, um, you can pile and burn, which gets rid of even more fuel. It's more expensive. It's harder to pull off. There's a lot of things that get in the way of trying to get a burn done. I'm proud of getting this much done for sure. Um, and when possible, when it's flat enough, when there's road access, and uh, when you have enough access to these kind, this kind of equipment, you can masticate. And that's what's happening here. This is an excavator with a mas masticating head. This thing is really cool. Just mow down all this vegetation, this problematic vegetation back here. It can break up stuff that's on the ground. Really powerful um, technique. Um, and just point out the masticators because they're on this arm. Um, they end up having very little, uh, they can have very low soil impacts as well because this trapped machine only disturbs the soil when it turns. And the reason for that is because it has to lock one of the treads and then drive the other and that tends to dig the treads into the ground. Basically, if you go out in an area that's been treated with this thing, you have a really hard time finding evidence that it was there. I was really surprised by that. There are other kinds of tools. They can be more nimble. This is a skid steer. Um, it's got this thing called a forestry attachment on it. This is just a, uh, a drum, masticating a drum here. This can mow down vegetation really effectively also. There are many other things that we might do in forests and sometimes dealing with our most pressing problems We'll also, we will also benefit by cutting canopy trees. Some of our forests need to be thinned at the canopy level, and that's good because we can get some uh, revenue from those things. One of the problems with these kinds of treatments, especially mastication, we need a lot of mastication done, but it is, you're always in the red with it. It's, it's never anywhere close to revenue neutral, and it's never revenue positive. So it really takes a lot, uh, going to take a lot of investment and a lot of careful planning and execution in order to deal with a lot of the problems that we're dealing that we're that we're facing, particularly those that are related to fire.